So please welcome Alexei Zaitsev, assistant professor at Skoltech. He'll be talking about self-supervised learning for sequential data. Welcome, my name is Alexei Zaitsev and today, as they have introduced me, I will be talking about the self-supervised learning for sequential data and about self-learning in general. What are the fundamental ideas that we need to make it work and what engineering tricks would really help to make it work even more smoothly. I am working at Skoltech and I am leading the Laboratory for Applied Research at uh, Skoltech Sperbank. We have engineers, PhD, masters, bachelor students. Uh, we actively release papers at different conferences and magazines and journals. And we make industrial joint projects with big market players, conduct fundamental research to understand better how and why deep learning works and what can we do to make it work even better. Also, we take a special look at how different methods that are not using or using non-marked data work and what is the better way to train model for computer vision. And that's what I will be talking about. Let me tell about why we need this thing, why it turns out that um, unmarked, I mean marked data is not enough and why we need to apply unmarked data without getting desired result. Then we'll be talking about different types of self-supervised learning. How can we split supervised learning, self-supervised learning in class and what are the main ideas corresponding to a particular class. Then we'll be talking about um, best um, methods today. We'll be talking about modern contestive self-supervised learning and then we'll take a deeper look at the more fundamental thing of training and the end result when we are looking at the self-learning methods and comparing them with uh, marked data, with learning based on marked data. And in the end, we'll take a better look at how it, this works in the real world for real tasks and whether it always so uh, justifies our hopes. And in the end, we'll come up with a conclusion about all of these methods that I have already mentioned. And we'll take a further look into the future to see what will be happening with the models. So let's begin with understanding how classical machine learning algorithms work. Imagine the traditional uh, ML task. We have a large selection of clients. For every client, we need to understand whether it will quit bank or not quit a particular bank. So we know some information about the client. For example, age, uh, salary, uh, etc. So the question is, will the client churn in three months? We can know age, education, uh, and in the end, turns out that we have representation of a client based on number of vectors and figures. Every single one of them correspond to a particular variable. So machine learning needs to, based on this understanding, imitate the decision that we make in the teaching selection so that the error would be as low as possible when we try to identify those people who will leave us in the upcoming future. So for standard objects for which we can suggest some sort of um, decent vector of, um, of uh, features, we can build a smart model. For example, what is on the input? We have unstructured data or non-structured at all. For example, we have an image or a text and no one can tell us what are the labels that we need to be getting out of this scenario. What kind of classifiers, what are the features, what are the values that help us to make the right decision? Some will ask, what's the connection uh, between the breed the cat and the length of the neck of a, of a cat? But turns out that you cannot evaluate this particular science based on the image, especially automatically. And that's why for this sort of data, we have an extra task, not only building based on the classifier that gives us correct answer. Another task is that we need to 
We need to make another transformation that according to the image gives us some smart vector of uh, descriptors of the object that are more or less universal. In the basic scenario, we want it to be usable to solve a particular task, but of course we would like to have as much information as possible about the object so that our image would be more or less universal. So when we build this um, representation, we can use it not only to solve the task that we have been learning, but also for other representations. For example, when we when we, for example, using the signs here, for example, when the image is far from the camera, etc., we want to have universal representation. It seems decent that this sort of representation needs to be made based on the unmarked data. So when we train a model using marked data, we collect a huge representation, we took every object in the representation and we got the mark. For example, we did it artificially or we hired a human who took a look at the date and said that this is a cat, this is a dog. And in this scenario, it turns out that it's all geared for one particular task. It would be smarter to build representation based on a huge volume of unmarked data and get the major concepts out of it that we called universal representation, which is easier to work with and that is more applicable for solving a larger range of tasks. We have other motivation as well, more humanitarian or more technical, more liberal arts, more lucrative related to the fact that we want to use the self-learning concepts, meaning when we have no markup whatsoever, we just have an understanding that we need to use this data somehow for representation without markup. So let's see it and let's look at how people learn. Pretty much the same scenario. Most of the info that we get is about unmarked data. Nobody's telling us this is a chair, this is a cat, this is a sky. We see it a couple of times and then we make a personal decision teaching our internal neural network that says that in a particular case we see a cat or a dog or a chair. Turns out that collecting high quality marked uh, representation of data is very expensive. So usually, imagine that it's about 10 million images and we know to which class belongs a particular image. I mean, this sort of selection is very expensive. And uh, the markup is not super precise unless you apply some special effort because people who are doing the markup, they will probably miss the class eventually. And uh, even when they don't miss the class, they're not highly interested to deliver you the best result. But that's why it's very hard to do quality control. Probably marker is not the most highly paid job, just watching the image and saying whether it's a cat or a dog. So it turns out that marking is not that high quality when you buy a selection from somewhere else. Ten million images is good, but there are billions of images online on Instagram. We want to use all of that info, which is more important even for text. There's so much text online and we want to use that text to get quality models. And the last point that we want for cheap get solution for other tasks. And this seems to be more efficient if we use universal representation, which is obviously better to create using self-learning. So let us look at the ideas that we've got regarding self-learning. Well, there are three major ideas. Generative model, contrastive model, or contrastive learning, and uh, the combination of first two. We will be talking less about the combination. So what is generative model in the simplest option at the level of idea? We're saying that we have some sort of imager text. Let us throw out part of that text and try to predict uh, the rest of the text based on what we have. Turns out that we don't need any markup. We just took the ready-made image and nobody prevents us from masking part of the image and try to restore it on the one hand. On the other hand, turns out that the entire pool of data is available to us. So the semantics 
So we need to be able to get out the entire semantics to augment the pieces that are missing. For contrastive learning, the idea is a bit different. Imagine that we have a couple of similar objects and a couple of objects that are not alike. Let us teach the representation so that when we look at the representation of similar objects, uh, that representation is similar in some, some sort of metrics, cosinus-based or Euclidean. Or if we take two other objects, their representation would also be different if the objects are different. Here's the example of a generator. This is the octane code architecture, more or less classical. So we have certain representation that we have. We use decoder, which gives us back some approximation of our initial image. And we restore a part of it. And we want to X and restored image would be similar. And we can define clearly the function of loss. There are a ton of tasks, tests there, but here's the major thing. The second option is contrast, when we don't have decoder, but we have an encoder. That makes two images. First we launch encoder, have representation X, then we have representation Y, and when we look at both representations, turns out that they need to be small or large distance in between. And in the third approach, we're trying to combine that. If we speak about the first approach in more detail, we have a ton of options on how we can throw out pieces of data. For example, we have this uh, huge uh, rectangle, and we can remove part of data. We can remove one and middle end and we can try to restore based on the data that we're missing. For example, we have available data in pink and uh, data to predict in blue. And when we restore this model, when we teach this, uh, train this restoration model, so at the output, we have this universal or less universal representation that we would need. So for text, it works pretty well. We take some sort of sentence, then we mask uh, a token or a word there and try to restore it based on our huge language model. And uh, into this red spot, we're trying to input something that's the most probable, hoping that our model will learn what to put into there, because if the model puts something wrong, we kind of punish the model for that, and it adapts, depending on what we want from it. So you can also try to increase complexity and get more complex ideas and combine different approaches. Contrastive predicting coding is a good example here because it has both encoder and autoregression. And encoder says that we want piece by piece of this pool of the sequence, get some sort of representation. Autoregression is telling us that we want to predict this representation to a certain amount of steps into the future. So with a correctly set loss function, we're not collapsing it. So we assume that all of the representations are similar. Thanks to that function, it is possible to train model at the output, get the representation of data for every particular particular step quite efficiently, meaning that they're also quite universal and we can take a ton of different input data. For example, here's the option of how we're processing audio signal to get uh, the representation of audio signal. It goes without saying that we're not going to be speaking about all of the methods because we don't have that time. However, I wanted to talk about more in more detail about contrastive approach because they're now the best especially for recognition of images. So, what do we want here for contrastive learning? We want to have an encoder that will generate, based on an image, some sort of representation. And we're getting something out of that representation. For example, we would want it to be completely random. Not completely random, sorry, not completely random. For example, we have three images over here. One is called anchor, one is called positive, another is called a negative. And we want that in the end, the space between the representation of anchor and positive was the least, because logically they're similar. There's some sort of catty at both of them. So the distance between the gap between anchor and positive should be as close as possible. And the anchor and negative gap should be the biggest. So we have 
um, mapping, we can easily define the loss function. Let's go and train our deep uh, learning neural network. For every ID, for every person, we can collect a set of faces, mark the data, and it will work as well. But if the data is unmarked, there's some sort of problem, but it's easily solved. For example, somehow we need to take and got similar images or pairs of images that we know are similar or different. So for the first task, we can easily take and cut out two pieces out of the same image and tell that the representation should be similar because it's the same image, obviously. So we take a kitty, we cut out two parts, and for those two parts, we apply encoder and the representations should be similar. So, in order to generate a pair of images that are not similar, we need simply and tell. Here are two random images out of, the, out of the billion images, and probably they're not similar because the second image is not a cat. In the end, we get a couple of positive examples, similar images, and a couple of negative examples, not similar images, and that works. So, we can actually apply that to a very different data type. Here is contrast approach for clients who are doing certain activities. For example, if we have clients of the bank or not a bank, they're spending money or something else is happening to them. They're entering the website and every entry to the website or every spending is some sort of event in their existence. And when we take a look at all of this in detail, we have some sequence of events, sequence, subsequence of events happening to a client. And therefore, we can try to use contrastive learning in this scenario taking sequences for a client. For every client, we have subsequence one and subsequence two, and they belong to the same client. Since those subsequences belong to both, both belong to the same client, uh, their representations should be similar. If we take a second client and we take subsequence three and subsequence four for that uh, for that client, turns out that between green representation and orange representation, there must be some maximum size distance. So in the end, we get some sort of contrastive learning, which is pretty decent. So representations of uh, embedding vectors of uh, subsequence 1 and 2 should be at minimal distance, similar for subsequences 3 and 4. We can even improve all of these ideas by adding a number of engineering tricks so that we could be working with this data. For example, in this contrast of learning, we can add what they call projecting projection head. We are not only augmenting two pieces of, uh, uh, of image, process them with encoder and get some sort of representation. We're also taking simple neural network uh, G that projects us to a more simple space, and we can see the similarity of these representations in a space of a relatively small size. So we can have a number of options of how we get deviated image from the initial image. So, for example, we can take a piece, what we call cropping in English, and um, we can do it differently. For example, we can uh, skew colors in the image or add some noise into the image, different sorts of noises. Turns out that all of this is pretty much uh, applicable, helping us to get even a better quality representation. But turns out that we can even go further and just reject the contrast learning paradigm whatsoever, having left only positive couples. We are not looking at the uh, unsimilar couples, only looking at similar couples. And for that, we are using architecture that is called um, BIOL. Bootstrap your own latent. We have two neural networks, purple and pink. Purple is what we're training, and pink is the approximation of what we used to have previously during training. So we want that representation that we get with the new blue network would be similar to the representation that we're getting, that we're getting from the pink uh, neural network below. Pink, red, whatever. So. In the end, we add the same ideas like before. So we generate based on X by all view to augmentation or to deviations that need to be delivering the same images. So in the end, we should be able to getting similar representations. Then it all works, even when we don't have the second neural network or the second 
uh, non-contrasting -contra image. We can train the network whatsoever, giving it more or less universal understanding of what's happening. So how can we tell that certain model of self-learning is, is good or bad? It's similar to how we evaluate uh, ordinary models. Let's look at the number of parameters in the model and see uh, the quality of the model. So that is how well it classifies, meaning selects top class for the data set ImageNet. When we have built a linear classifier based on the representation that we're getting with our representation model, either supervised uh, models with marks or BYOL, uh, the approach that I just explained to you. As you may see, may have seen in the image. And we see that the difference in quality between supervised and BIOL is not that great, especially if there is a ton of parameters. If we have 400 million parameters, that the difference between BIOL and supervised baseline is pretty close. If there are less parameters, then BIOL is lacking something to have qualitative representation, so we have 3% gap or 2% gap if we're not selecting specifically supervised approach, we do not uh, augment it, we're using it as it is. If we would apply it in a stronger model, then we'll be using a ton of tricks and uh, the quality will change even further. So we probably should restore it with a baseline solution. In addition to that, we can compare it differently. I mean, we can see what's happening if we solve a different task. Option one is try to classify other sort of data, types of food like pizza, chocolate cake, or something else, or classify the type of buildings or type of scenes, visual scenes. And if we take a lot of such tasks and train either a linear classifier over representations or adapt the entire model just a little bit, then turns out that in this case, the self-learning approaches work not worse, but better than uh, the approaches that use markup. We're using, we're seeing the same situation when we're solving the segmentation task or depth identification task. It's really, really good for BIOL compared to other methods and compared to the approaches that use um, supervised training with a teacher. If we talk about the disadvantages of BIOL, turns out that they're quite evident if we dip, uh, dig a bit deeper. Turns out that we need a lot of RAM, to a lot of memory to train this sort of model. Because if we show a little number of examples, the network uh, trains quite oddly and the quality is not that great. We need to show it a ton of examples right away, like 4,000, not 128 that we had, which pretty much work for supervised training with a teacher. Another thing is that we need to generate correctly the similar images, meaning that we need to be using various options of augmentation. And only after that, it needs to work pretty good. It will be working pretty good. We can also be searching and looking at other approaches that may work even better. But if we take a special look at the theoretical part of it, why it works, turns out that certain explanation is there. But as usually for deep learning, we cannot say it very precisely. We can be looking at a very simple model, trying to analyze its behavior, trying to catch some similar effects. <laughs> the, the representations that we have um, got and see, well, the most reasonable out of them. And we can take a look at uh, what's happening with the model that we got based on the supervised, self-supervised with a teacher. And let's host an experiment. Let us uh, take certain pool and uh, get parameters of the supervised and self-supervised model and let's see how much op what, what is the, the local optimum as fast as possible. Turns out that we can quickly quickly get out of the self-supervised optimum. When we get out a little bit, the quality drops significantly. So the loss function is growing rapidly, which means that our self 
uh, supervised approach is a bit worse. If we look at the surroundings at the neighborhood of our optimum, when we optimize parameters, let's, for example, take a look at the major components, like break it apart into major components, and look at the neighborhood. What is the loss function uh, in the neighborhood? It turns out that for a self-supervised, it's pretty small in the neighborhood. So we get good model, and it's it's tight. For a supervised approach, it's not that great. So it's less stable, unfortunately. That's why it's not clear whether it will work good. In addition, there are additional problems, such as we need vast data pools, vast data sets, and a long time to train the model to get at least some sort of quality model. Here's an example of how we're using self-supervised approach, and in two options you can see in option one, we're using the entire pool, the entire data set, and use a lot of air epochs. And in the scenario number two, we don't have much resources. And that's why the quality drops very evidently, although it's better compared to not having anything. So we have some representation, it's just worth it. We don't have enough data or don't have enough time. So this approach is pretty universal. We have been trying to do the same thing for oil data. They have also some rows of data related to mining. We were drilling. And turns out that we were getting pretty quality representation reflecting some physical properties of the wells. Turns out that if we have correct representation, the wells are similar in the real life. So it's not only limited to images and texts. A few words of conclusion. What can I say evaluating the condition of self-learning at the moment? It does work, and we truly can get efficient kind of a completion to learning. We don't fully understand why it's some sort of magic, but some explain this magic, and we have some explanation to that magic as well. And the selection of a particular method depends on the task. It's more about natural language research, but we can see that contrastive approach is a bit better. However, not always. And it all begins to work if we correctly do the data augmentation, although that all requires a lot of time and a lot of effort to make this thing work. I believe that in the upcoming couple of years we will see more efficient approach, approaches to self-learning and they will be able to get us more universal representation without investing a ton of time and adapting it faster to other sorts of tasks, not only text and images. Hopefully I'll get to do that as well in my lab. And here's our lab. We have an amazing team. Many thanks to all of them for helping to make this happen. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who is watching us. Whoa! You guys, we have a couple of questions, Alexei. Please try to answer that quickly. <laughs> How quickly a model can adapt to necessary parameters? How many do you drop it so that so that it fits? If we speak about how many times we need to start restart the learning, usually we do it once if we adapt it to a different task. We don't need a ton of data for that. It, this can be done at 1% of ImageNet. And we get similar results um, to using 100% if we train representation correctly in the first place. Why don't you use um, average key method? If it commence for clustering, turns out it leads to pretty stupid representation. This is a bit of a atomic nuclear uh, mode, which doesn't work for smaller spaces. But contemporary approaches are trying to fix that, and certain representations are also working for the closest neighbor methods. If we look at the articles that were released like a month ago based on transformers for computer vision. These are all the questions. Thank you so much, dear friends. Let's continue.